Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of LPL Market Signals. Uh, Jeff Bookbinder here, back with you for another week. Pleased to be joined by Quincy Crosby to walk through um, the events of last week, certainly. And there were some big events for markets last week. And then, um, you know, talk a little international, um, quick earnings update and preview this week. So there's the uh, agenda for today. How are you, Quincy? It's good. Good to be back on, on you know, the wires with you after last Thursday. And that was before Friday's surprise, right? Friday's uh, labor su payroll surprise. Yes, we got we got a couple surprises. I guess you could say maybe one good, one mixed. Um, uh, so we'll go through the jobs report and what we heard from the Fed, uh, certainly. But uh, as you can see on this screen, a lot more to cover. So let's jump right in. It's February 7th, 2023, as we're recording this. And, um, you know, we'll have a little bit of a global flavor here. Of course, that's in your title, Quincy, uh, global strategist. So, um, you know, certainly going to cover some non-U.S. with the bulk of the call. Uh, but just looking at the, um, you know, market performance for last week, it's Tuesday morning as we're recording this. So we did sell off a little bit on Monday. But as we're looking at last week, you know, the market was up 1.6% despite the uh, too hot jobs report. I think we'll all agree. Certainly surprisingly hot uh, jobs report and another uh, rate hike from the Fed. Stocks are up four of the last five weeks. Actually, the NASDAQ was up five straight weeks uh, through um, last week. So, you know, and then we also had some disappointing earnings, some big names. And uh, the market kind of sailed right through that. So, you know, that probably stands out most here is what a great week for the NASDAQ, even though, you know, most agree that those results from the mega cap techs uh, weren't that great. In terms of sectors, um, you know, the mega cap techs do well, then you're going to see gains for tech. You're going to see gains for communication services, right? That's where uh, Google and Facebook are, or meta alphabet. Uh, and then um, consumer discretionary, you know, pretty good week last week with, um, you know, Amazon being a big chunk there. And Tesla, we've seen some gains for autos, really strong gains for autos so far year to date. Um, so, um, Quincy, what stands out to you here, um, you know, either domestically or, or internationally that you would call out? Well, you know, what is what is. I would have to use the word fascinating about the market is that the market has been signaling a a recovery ever since the um, consumer price index report started to show clearly that inflationary pressures are easing and they're easing more quickly as as we as the fed's rate hikes have continued and that and again it's the market looking ahead it's looking ahead at uh, the terminal rate where the Fed basically finishes. The question really is though, is the, is the terminal rate going to be higher? Now that we have seen some more strength in the economy, take a look at the uh, Purchasing Manager Index report on the service sector, which is the largest component of our economy. That has shown tremendous resilience, surprising to the upside. And also, uh, we have, a, you know, a this tug of war that we've talked about so often between strategists who are suggesting that, you know, the market is going to pull back dramatically uh, as margin um, operating margins compress, come down dramatically. And yet, as you pointed out, Jeff, the 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 earnings season, yeah, it hasn't been stellar, but it certainly hasn't been dire either. And the market is prepared to look ahead and look ahead at a, you know, at a period in which the Fed is going to be finished. Isn't that, in fact, the market's job? Oh, absolutely. You know, you want to talk about climbing a wall of worry. Yeah. Well, that's what we've certainly seen uh, this year. It's, uh, yeah. you know, markets aren't completely over the wall <laughs> yet. That's right. for yeah. sure as we have Chinese spy balloons flying overhead, but uh, nonetheless, we are uh, through. I think most of the uh, most of the worries. I guess we saw, you know, we'll talk more about international when, but when mega cap tech in the U.S. works, it's very difficult for Europe, which makes up the bulk of the MSCI EFA index, to keep up. 
And so certainly we saw that. And you have you know, a little bit of an upward move in the dollar just in the past few days after, you know, really, I think a double digit decline. Uh, so that certainly weighed a little bit on international. So the U.S. Uh, was a better place to be last week, but certainly the trend over the last few months uh, has been in favor of international. Uh, really quickly, bonds and commodities. So, um, you know, the stock market got all the attention uh, last week. I guess the good news here is that bonds didn't get hurt worse because of that strong uh, job support. Yeah. Right? The, the, the bond market kind of didn't do a whole lot, at least the core bond market. And then we had high yield, which, of course, is equity sensitive, do really well. That's what you would expect when, you know, the stock market is up and and markets are embracing uh, riskier assets. But I think turning to the the other side of this, Quincy, the commodity market, like we know that natural gas has just been plummeting, and that's been a good story for Europe. Uh, but you know why why is oil down uh, so much? You know, over this period, by the Bloomberg measure, it's down. You know, it was down ten percent last week. This is this is another fascinating story. You know, within the energy markets, you still have Russian oil getting out. I mean, fact in fact. One of the interesting anecdotes to this to this oil story is that India has been buying a lot of Russian oil. There's tremendous pressure on India from the U.S. On, you know, in terms of trying to get India to to pull away from that tight relationship with Russia. But nonetheless, what we're seeing is that they are buying quite a bit of of uh, Russian oil at a, at a discount. And that oil is actually showing up in the United States. So it shows you the fungibility of, of the oil market. We used to see this, by the way, when I followed it, um, the energy markets years ago, very closely because that was my job, where we would see Iranian oil showing up all over the world despite sanctions. It's because it is a spot market and oil just flows the way that it, it flows. But th the point also is, the worry in the energy market that there will be a downturn, that demand for oil will, will go down. There also was a slight uptick in supplies, but the expectations are that that will dampen as uh, the true reopening of China actually begins. So many of the commodities pulled back. Take a look at uh, steel. Take a look at iron ore. That pullback, you could you could say, Quincy, well, the market was looking at a stronger dollar, but really what it is, is concern that because of COVID, because of the late reopening, uh, you're not going to see that the pickup in demand that we expected to see early on. It's going to take a little bit more time before China really starts a true reopening. That said, and I need to point this out, the, um, and the agencies that do follow uh, oil imports actually saw that even at the margin, we started to see China starting to pick up their uh, oil uh, imports. Now, th by the way, they, they're using uh, Saudi Arabian oil exports, perhaps more than they are of, of from Russia. But nonetheless, the larger picture is that China has not, that reopening has not been quick enough for a market that basically tried to front load an important uh, reopening. Yeah, a lot of people thought, uh, Quincy, that the China reopening would would start to push oil higher sooner. It just right. uh, hasn't yeah. happened yet. Uh, no. But that that mm -hmm. that run may be ahead of us. Uh, so, you know, one of the big stories last week was the Fed. And, you, you know, you alluded to it, right? They raised rates. I think it's really important for people to keep in mind that they're now above core PCE. So in other words, the Fed funds rate the Fed's target interest rate is higher than the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. So that puts them in the restrictive camp. And that's one of the reasons why uh, most think that they're either, you know, going to be done with one more hike uh, or, you know, potentially uh, two more 25 basis point hikes. So, but they are restrictive. And, you know, these, as you know, as well as anyone, Quincy, the Fed tightening measures, uh, they, they affect the economy with a leg, right? And so they're already tight now, and the economy hasn't fully felt these rate increases that we've seen to date. So I think the Fed knows it has to be really careful uh, not to over-tighten. Powell alluded to it in his comments at the press conference last week, 
right? And and when they when you look at something like this, it's it shows you there is some risk um, of of over tightening. Well, yes. I mean, the, the only thing is, I mean, given that economics is hardly considered to be a science, is there is even a tug of war with that, and that is. There are those who think, and some of the prominent measures of the Fed board um, are pointing out that because of the communication uh, that we have from the Fed to the general public, to business owners, and it's it's you know the transparency that we don't need that historical twelve to eighteen month lag period before the uh, rate hikes, and then when we have rate cuts, flow through all crevices of the economy that that now can be shortened to approximately even six to maybe nine or 10 months. That has been a major shift uh, from some, of, again, some of the prominent, I would have to say, pragmatic hawks uh, at the Fed that maybe now, again, because of so much communication, we would argue too much communication, but that that effect on the overall economy may come much sooner than the historical data suggest, which is really interesting because that would be just around the corner. Yeah, good point. So we're we're just starting to feel those seventy five basis point hikes now, uh, and uh, but but more still to come. So Quincy, the other big or one of the other big stories last week, the jobs report, right? This was a a boomer, right? Five hundred seventeen thousand jobs now. I guess about 75,000 were just from a strike ending in California, yeah. um, government jobs. But nonetheless, still, even if you call it 440, just a really strong number, right? Which, you know, the good news is it supports the economy, right? Um, consumers are seeing rising wages. They have jobs. We have basically a 50-year low in unemployment. But of course, the bad news is uh, this has the Fed's attention. I don't know that they had this number when they when Powell gave his comments on Wednesday. I don't think they did. Uh, but, um, you know, nonetheless, this makes maybe the Fed's bias a little more hawkish uh, than it was when they delivered the message Wednesday. So um, we'll have to see if, you know, if, if we're going to have a soft landing or soft ish landing, it's going to have to be driven by the consumer having jobs and seeing rising wages. You know, they haven't spent all those um, you know, all that excess cash yet. Consumers in aggregate still have a little excess cash. Uh, so um, a soft landing, maybe the high, it's a, got a higher probability than it had a month ago, but it's still certainly, um, you know, a less than 50-50 shot uh, at this point. So that was the other big story. And then the, the last big story last week, I think, was the tech earnings. I'll get into earnings a little bit more in a minute. I wanted to point out this trend in the market action this year. Um, these are uh, numbers from Bespoke Investment Group. They just do a phenomenal job slicing and dicing the markets into what's working and what's not. And um, I highlighted here the change in 2022 as, I guess, the strongest factor. So if you did nothing this year except buy the worst stocks last year, you're up huge, right? On average, 40% for the bottom decile of 2022 performers in the Russell 1000. That is just remarkable. Some people are calling it a dash for trash, right? Stocks that analysts don't like are doing really well, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, stocks that have a lot of short interest are doing really well. So, you know, we don't think this will continue, uh, but it's been a very powerful force here over the first, you know, call it um, five weeks of the year. Uh, so let's get keep moving here. This is, um, you know, chart of the S&P 500 highlighting the Golden Cross. Um, you know, Quincy, you and I aren't certainly CMTs or pure uh, technicians, but, you know, our chief technical strategist, Adam Turnquist, ran the numbers on this. If you just get a golden cross, you know, 50 day moving average over the 200 day moving average, that alone isn't really a positive market signal. It gets attention, but it doesn't really lead to better returns. However, if you look at golden crosses, when the market is below its 200 day or mm -hmm. i'm sorry which, which is when the market is seeing a falling 200 day moving average right that's the yellow line here on the screen the 200 day moving average when it's declining and you get a golden cross uh you know like we're seeing now we're still in a bear market the forward returns are outstanding 
16 percent uh, plus average returns over the next 12 months historically so you know this is good news for the market we got through that 4100 support or resistance level yes. uh that can turn into support now uh and uh and this golden cross in a downward sloping 200 day another positive uh sign so um, the technicals are looking good. We're seeing good breadth too, and um, you know, suggests maybe more gains ahead. So, so Quincy, this is your, you know, the another story that you know we got <laughs> late last week that seemed to affect markets a little bit was what we'll call balloon gate. I know this is your favorite slide in the deck. Uh, <laughs> if you can boil this down to a minute, right, so <laughs> we had U.S. China tensions before they're real, uh, as we all know, uh, but this sort of took it up a level in terms of the tense U.S.-China relationship? No, absolutely. You know, yes, it's been subject to, to tremendous um, late-night humor. But the fact is, it is yet another indication of uh, the tensions building, despite, despite, by the way, an attempt by the U.S., by, by uh, China, to mend uh, some of the uh, bilateral relations, particularly when it comes to uh, trade, e economic, uh, climate, maybe maybe this the, the, if this turned out to be a climate um, weather watching balloon, but none but, but nonetheless, it is one area where there is tremendous support on both sides of the aisle, and, and the, the Chinese do understand that that the Republicans and the Democrats together understand that they are um, having, they're being forced to control exports to China. They're trying, the U.S. is trying to have our allies similarly control the exports. And, and the other aspect to it has to do with military spending. We always try to put it in a, you know, in a market context, what's working, what's not working. And what has been working has been defense spending. Now, there are concerns that we'll see a cut in def defense spending as you get closer to the budget um, budget uh, date, right, which right now is probably in August, and that the Republicans may come in and say, hey, start cutting, cutting, cutting. But in this environment, it is hard to see where you're going to see big cuts in def defense spending. In fact, we're seeing globally defense spending picking up. So the Raptor, it sounds like something out of the Bible, does it not? The raptor that grabbed the balloon is the next generation after the F-16. We all know the F-16. You hear it. Ukraine wants F-16 uh, fighter planes. But this that was the next generation of stealth um, uh, uh, aircraft. So this, this seemingly innocent, seemingly funny balloon actually has you know, been hovering over the U.S., but I would have to add hovering over bilateral relations. It's not so funny what it projects uh, moving ahead in terms of, um, you know, what what the U.S. is bracing for in terms of Taiwan and also uh, military expansion in the South Sea China area. Yeah, geopolitical tensions are are ratcheting up. We we don't know when. China makes a move on Taiwan, but you got to keep that in mind that that's something we're probably going to have to deal with in the future. <clears throat> I think bottom line for investors right now is, and you've said it yourself, Quincy, is EM's more of a trade than an investment right now. But so, I do want to say something, Jeff, in terms of what we're seeing. We saw this early on, even before this, in terms of uh, institutional management for emerging markets, because emerging markets are extremely popular now. Uh, given given that the dollar had weakened, given that the evaluations were compelling. But we're seeing more and more ETFs coming out ex-China. So emerging market ETFs ex-China. Portfolios that in, we saw during before the dollar had weakened, uh, institutional money managers coming out and having a emerging market portfolio, but China in another category, not in that portfolio. They didn't want, quote unquote, contamination into emerging market stock picking uh, and have any bilateral issue, geopolitical issue, contaminating it. But we're now seeing it in terms of retail, because we've always talked about active management, have we not, for emerging markets? Oh, yeah. Active management makes a ton of sense. Active management, ex-China, 
probably makes even more sense. Exactly. So, exactly. Our exactly. View hasn't, yeah. Our view hasn't changed at all there. Um, yes. No doubt. <clears throat> so let's turn to, you know, where I want to spend um, a little more time, Quincy, which is international. We have several charts here from our weekly market commentary this week, which you can find on LPL.com, you know, asking the question, should investors go outside the U.S.? This is de uh, developed markets I'm referring to, okay. not emerging markets. And so when we compared, you know, kind of all the pros and cons over the last couple of months, we've become more interested in uh, non-U.S. developed markets. And mm -hmm. so uh, we've frankly upgraded them a couple of times. Uh, and now we're pretty much equal weight between uh, the U.S. and international. So let's let's dig into this. So I'll show you some of the analysis uh, you know, that we did that went into this decision. So first earnings, uh, the EFA index, developed international index, is in orange. Estimates uh, for the MSCI EFA earnings have been revised significantly higher over the last uh, four or five months or so. You see that with this arrow pointing up. Some of that's the falling dollar, but it's on its way up. And it's now at the point where we would argue that the EFA is likely to generate a little more earnings growth this year than the S&P. S&P probably be down a point or two, maybe a little bit more. EFA could very easily be flat. Uh, a lot depends certainly on the impact of the energy crisis on, um, you know, on core Europe, right? Germany in particular. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, this is this is trending toward international, both maybe a little more growth or a little better, you know, a little smaller decline and better revisions. Uh, we also have cheaper stocks overseas than we do in the U.S. That's pretty much always the case, but now even more dramatically so. You see the PEs, forward PEs for U.S. international and EM, and international is at the biggest discount by far of these three measures relative to its recent history, 10-year history. Uh, and then if you just look at um, the discounts to the U.S., the international discount is almost as large as the EM discount, which is unusual. So, you know, essentially EFA is about 10% cheaper than it's been. Uh, so you really got to say uh, valuations favor international and earnings maybe slightly uh, favor international. So we've kind of got a, you know, maybe it's a pitcher's duel, as I mentioned in the, in the weekly market commentary, maybe it's a close race, kind of a low scoring game. But EFA looks like maybe on earnings and on valuations, it's a little bit of a better place to be. <clears throat> now, here's the reason to buy buy U.S., Quincy. And you wrote the piece on Europe here. Uh, we're showing the economic surprise index. So data in Europe has been exceeding expectations at a very strong rate, uh, essentially since the end of last summer, uh, despite all the calls for recession with the impact of higher natural gas prices. Uh, so my question for you, Quincy, is what's been working in Europe beyond just lower natural gas prices and a warmer winter? What's been going on here that's allowed the Europe, uh, the Eurozone economic data uh, to come in so strong relative to expectations? Well, China, 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 as it became increasingly clear that the authorities in China were going to move away from zero COVID, measures, which were incredibly stringent, strict, pushed the economy, Chinese economy, into cl as close to recession as you could probably have, with still being able to at least demonstrate they had some growth, which, you know, it's, it's based on their data. But as it became clear that it was untenable, despite the October plenum, where uh, the uh, she was inaugurated, so to speak, for a third term, uh, it, you started to see a pickup it, with the expectations that the measures would ease, not, not be expunged, but ease. And we started to see interest in, um, in Europe. And again, it, it coincides with uh, gas prices coming down, less, less, uh, less uh, seasonably uh, warm, uh, warm winter. But the other part is, the measures were taken away completely. And as soon as we saw that, where literally first it was targeted, remember it was a targeted approach, you started to see interest boom. 
in, um, in Europe, because those countries, Italy, Germany, France, even the Netherlands, stronger uh, have stronger trade relations with China than we do. Mm -hmm. And so you started to see the inflow. Now that could be the work uh, initially of the algorithms that do operate in, um, in e EFA land, but nonetheless, the expectations are that trade relations will be restored at a faster clip and the rewards of those trade relationships and Chinese uh, uh, you know, authorities bolstering demand will, will accrue to, um, to Europe as opposed to the United States. Yep, great point. The, the China trade ties for Europe are um, absolutely uh, part of the story. The reason I say that this is maybe a reason you know, to, to be a little bit more U.S. focused is because the risk to the European economy has not gone away. Right. And so after we get through this, you know, celebration of the warm weather, weather we still got a, you know, war in Ukraine. We've, you know, we've mm -hmm. still got a Eurozone economy that structurally is not built to grow as fast as the U.S., not as innovative uh, as the U.S. So, um, you know, we'll see where the tide goes. But, um, you know, but Jeff, being well, leveraged to the European economy for the long term might not be the best approach. I also want to add something that you've been stressing. And it is that they do not have that bulk of big tech names weighing down the, the markets the way we do. Remember the big mega tech are about 20 to 22% in terms of weight on the S&P 500. They do not have that. And so as you've pointed out so often, once the interest in big tech is viable as opposed to an initial you know, trade as we have, have seen recently, uh, then I think you're going to see funds coming back into the U.S. because the expectations are something will cause our valuations to become increasingly compelling. And, it, and that would include more interest in big tech. Big tech is dormant right now. I mean, yes, we've had some trading in it, and that's been very, that's been positive if you own those names. But the expectations are that we will see a, a potential pullback, but that we will then see them come back into favor for not traders, but long-term investors. And that would probably give the U.S. the edge over um, over Europe. Yeah, we don't think this mega cap tech strength is sustainable just yet. Just but yet. That's something we're, we're watching really closely. Yeah. Uh, so the last chart on international that we had in the weekly market commentary is just the dollar. Look, it was down, you know, about 11%. Um, from uh, the the late September highs, which is a tailwind for international markets and a tailwind for uh, international earnings generated by U.S. multinationals. So, you know, generally our team thinks um, that the dollar has a little more downside to go, but it's very hard to have a high conviction on a uh, on a currency forecast. So, um, you know, but as the Fed moves closer to the end of its hiking campaign, and then the you know, the ECB is kind of later, more hiking ahead of it, uh, and probably higher for longer more so than in the U.S. Uh, that could mean a little downward pressure on the on the U.S. dollar. So um, let's get through earnings real quick here, Quincy, and then we'll preview the week and wrap. Um, I think the, you know, earnings have been soft. Well, hey, we'll, we'll use Powell's word, softish, not a disaster, as you, as you laid out up front. But we're still going to miss, it looks like, based on facts at data. You know, we thought we would get maybe down three when earnings season began. We're probably going to get down five. But the good news here is that misses aren't being punished as much as they historically are. And beats are being rewarded maybe a little bit more uh, than they typically are. And even though big tech, I mean, big tech is seeing an earnings decline of around 10% in aggregate, right? There's nothing good about that. <clears throat> but the market rallied anyway. So I think that just tells you that there's a lot of negativity priced in here. Um, markets expected earnings estimates for 2023 to come down. And, uh, you know, probably most expect they're going to go down another $10 or so, um, you know, maybe in the 215 range. Strategists seem to be kind of centering around $215, maybe 210 in earnings per share next year. We're still a little higher than that at 220 
uh, but we recognize the downside. So maybe the message here, Quincy, is that you know markets expected bad news, and it's not quite as bad as as feared. And um, and now you know we can kind of move past it. Well, yeah, and especially you know the companies that come in with the bad news, but then come up with cost cutting measures, particularly the layoffs. The market has, in general, responded positively to that tech or or, or you know other other sectors. So it's been extremely important um, that that in terms of the guidance, the companies come out and say, look, we we understand we understand the environment, but we are cutting costs and we're going to do it immediately. And and that has worked wonders. Oh, it has absolutely. That was certainly part of. Um the meta slash Facebook yeah. uh, rally uh, that, that we saw. And there've been a number of other examples of that. Uh, so this is our earnings season dashboard. You can see here, the numbers are are not great, but uh, not a disaster. So let's turn to the previewing of the week before we get to my final slide here, which is which is my favorite, our Super Bowl preview. Um, <laughs> so um, the, uh, you know, the big events, this is a quiet week of economic data. Um, I guess today, Fed speaker, our Fed Chair Powell speaks shortly after we're done here recording. That is probably the biggest event of the week. But consumers credit, you know, I'm sure that's somewhat relevant. Um, and Mi University of Michigan inflation expectations are certainly relevant. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of Fed speakers. You mentioned it earlier in, in the podcast, Quincy. There's, <laughs> the Fed's probably talking more than we would like. Well, yeah, you know, it, but I think today's speech uh, at the uh, uh, in Washington, D.C., is going to be more important for the market's direction, at least immediate direction, than uh, the press conference following the Fed uh, Fed meeting. Because this is the meeting in which he will have to discuss the strength of the labor market. And remember, we've talked about this at the stock meeting so many times, that the Fed has moved away from this notion that you have to crater the labor market in order to reduce inflation. Remember, they've even suggested early on, if we have to do it to bring inflation down to the 2% level that represents price stability, we'll, we'll do it. But they've moved away from that. The question now is, it's even, even if we take out some of the, the uh, labor market numbers and bring it down to 400, even 300, the question is, how does the Fed react to this labor market report? Mary Daly, head of the San Francisco Fed, had one word, wow. Okay, the wow matters, but it also changes what the futures market thinks that the Fed is going to do and it has added another rate hike, a second rate hike, and taken away one a rate cut for 2023. Yeah, hopefully the market can just focus on how close we are to the end. Yes, exactly. Not, we are. There's no doubt worry, about that. Right, yeah. And not worry so much about, well, are we going to have a cut in December or not? Exactly. Or, or whatever. It, precisely. You know, the, the, the point is the Fed, at least for now, is is winning this inflation battle. They're getting help from market forces, but uh, they're winning. And um, we still think it's pretty pretty high probability that March is the last hike. We'll see. Uh, but, um, you know, that's where that's where LPR research is right now. Uh, so um, with that, we'll wrap up by just saying uh, enjoy the big game. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, many of you will be watching. As a lifelong Chiefs fan, I certainly will be watching. I know some Eagles fans are probably watching this, so I won't lay it on too thick. Uh, but I'll just say, go Chiefs! And I think it's a really neat story. It's neat that you have, you know, two African American quarterbacks facing each other, but it's also neat that you have Kelsey, uh, the two brothers, uh, going against each other. And so, uh, Mama Kelsey will be the star of the show the next few days. Uh, she, you know, she'll be she'll be both happy and sad. <laughs> I think. Uh, after the game. So every, so uh, everyone enjoy the game. Uh, Quincy, I know you're an excellent cook, so you'll probably whip up some good some goodies. Uh, uh, yeah, no, no absolutely. And, and how we stand, just so just we can get our plug in, we go with the um, the enemy of, of our enemy is our friend. I leave it with that. Uh, so are you dropping a hint as to who your uh who Yeah, your because team? Yeah, if our team does this, if our team's not in the playoff, we'll go with, we'll, we'll go with the... Um, the enemy of, of our enemy. Yes. So Okay. So yeah. all the Dallas, Dallas fans can root for the Chiefs. Giants fans can root for the Chiefs. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's uh that that's yeah. the that's mm -hmm. the angle. That's what um, it means. Yeah. 
Very good. So um, with that, we'll wrap. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, Quincy, for, for joining. Thank you. Good, good conversation uh, for all of you. Um, well, in addition to enjoying the game, have a wonderful week. And we'll be back with you next week. Uh, we'll see Thank you then. You. Thanks for listening to LPL Market Signals.